The topic today is the hidden gospel, the love of God, and the last events in the history of the planet. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the second last book in the Bible, which is the book of Jude. Here Jude tells us that we need to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Jude, and we're going to read by the grace of God, 13 verses out of this one chapter book. Jude, easy to find folks, just before Revelation. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. It is quite possible that this man was actually related to our blessed Lord. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love to you in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend, to struggle for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. The Bible tells us, that we need to contend or struggle for the faith that was delivered to the saints. And the Bible tells us why. Jude tells us why. Verse 4, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Although you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he is kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah, I say, my friend, go read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and read it in the book of Genesis and discover why God destroyed these cities. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Beware. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively about whatever they do not understand and what things they do understand by instinct like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's era. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And these were people in the church. Verse 12, these men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackness and darkness has been reserved forever. Now, who was this Jude? It says that he was the brother of James. Some believe that this was the James who was the Lord's brother. He was one of the saints of God in the church and one of the great preachers of the eternal gospel. And he said the time would come when there would be a widespread departure from the faith 
even among Christians. And he says, what you need to do is to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The times do not cry out for compromise. I want you to hear this. The times demand courage for the crisis. Would you for a moment, please with me, think of events that are taking place in the world today. There is North Korea. What a regime. A communist, atheistic, Marxist regime. In spite of all that we can say and do, now in possession of nuclear weapons, and apparently ruled, uh, ruled by people who have no capacity to reason and to think rationally. They are building rockets, and they've tested some of their rockets. The time will come, if not next week, the time will come when North Korea will have the capacity to put a nuclear device on a missile. It is all of a sudden a very dangerous world. I am convinced in my own soul, I don't say this because I'm just a Bible preacher. I say it because I, I look at the evidence. I believe that the great clock is ticking and we have come down to the last hours in the history of the human race. You don't need to turn to the passage, but in Revelation, it has a picture of the four angels who are holding back the winds of strife until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. And God says to the angels, hold, hold, hold. But the day is going to come when the angels will no longer be restrained by the Spirit of God. We are living in the last moments when God is telling the angels to restrain themselves. Would you please come over here to Revelation chapter 9. This is a most interesting text. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13 down to 16. Revelation chapter 9 and verses 13 down to 16. I want you to notice some pertinent words as we read these verses. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. This is the story of the seven trumpets. And I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready, look at these words, for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. What I want to point out today, that God has got a time. God has got a plan for the human race. And finally, it comes down to the last hour of the last day, of the last month, of the last year, and then God says, let it go. And then we have the battle of Armageddon, the seven last plagues preceded by the last great conflict. Then, of course, 
Not only does the world face the threats and the bluster from North Korea, which is a communist state, but then we have a Muslim state, Iran, with a tremendous hatred towards Israel, who already is armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. We can say they will never, never, never get it, nuclear weapons. We said that about the North Koreans. What I want you to know, my friends, it is no longer business as usual in the world. We now look back today upon the time of the Cold War with the Russians. It almost seems a period of tranquility. We are dealing now with madmen. Then there are other signs that are brought forth in the word of God. I want you to come over here to Matthew 24, please, which is called, as you will remember, the little apocalypse, because it's similar to the book of Revelation. Matthew 24 and verse 9 and onwards. And notice the words of our blessed Lord. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Look at me. People have said, but we will never, never have persecution in the United States of America. I tell you, in the name of God, the day is coming soon when people living in America will be persecuted for their Christian faith. Churches will be marked. They will be harassed and pastors will be imprisoned because they dared to read texts from the Bible. My friend, Dr. Graham Bradford, who is a great conservative scholar, said to me about my own homeland, even today in Australia, it is becoming dangerous to read certain texts out of the Bible or else you'll be prosecuted and persecuted. The Bible says that persecution is going to come to the church. Read on. At first, verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness and the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Jesus, our blessed Lord, said, in the last days, there would be a time of apostasy among Christians. And this apostasy would somehow involve the persecution of the faithful. I believe the day is coming right here in America when persecution will break out against Christians because of their fidelity to the truth. Come over here to Genesis, please. Over here to the book of Genesis. And this is a description of the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, and verses 5 and onwards. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he'd made man on the earth. His heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor 
in the eyes of the Lord, or grace in the eyes of the Lord. And verse 11 and onwards, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was filled with violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Uh, Please listen to me. And I want to talk to you just softly. And I want to just say some things that are in my heart today. Today, sin is encouraged, glorified, and praised. While I don't plan to major on this today, because I've said quite a bit, if you and I depart from Scripture, And the law of God. We set out upon a path of self-destruction. Jesus, our blessed Lord, said, In the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. At least he better and cleave unto his wife. And the two, man and woman, shall become one flesh. Listen to this. I believe that in the noble history of the United States of America that God raised up, God raised up America as a bastion for Bible believers. America was not based on Marxism or communism or atheism. America was based on the faith of the Pilgrim Fathers. Why has God blessed America? Because of her faith in God. Because she has believed to a greater or a lesser extent that we are the children of the Creator and that God's law is eternal. Listen to me. And many people agree with me. People like Billy Graham, his son Franklin, and I could go on and on, people who believe in God and the Bible. In all the noble history of the United States of America, the greatest Assault upon America is taking place now. Because if you destroy the American family, you destroy America. God gave two great institutions in the Garden of Eden. Number one, the Lord's Day. It's almost gone. As the great theologian said, when the holy day becomes the day of man, society and humanity wither away and the demons rule. Let the Lord's day go and the demons rule. No time for God. And the second of God's twins from the Garden of Eden is the Sabbath. There are two institutions that the devil hates with all his evil soul. The Sabbath and marriage. And today there is an assault starting at the very top to destroy the American home. That, my friend, is the betrayal of America. And this is one 
of the last signs before the Lord comes. There is now a plan, listen, to change the very fabric of society. That which every civilization has believed in for thousands of years is now under assault. This is a sign. There is today a war against God, the Bible, and the law of God. I heard a an Englishman on CNN who is quite famous and does such a great job, I think, on so many occasions. But he was interviewing a famous American pastor and a good man, a man of God who has just lost his son from the Saddleback Church. And he said to that man who said, no, a marriage is between a man and a woman, he said, well, maybe we ought to change the Bible. That's what he said. He said, well, you know, we, well, if the Bible says that, we need to change the Bible, don't you think? Something similar was said to uh, the great Dr. Billy Graham's son, and he said, we cannot and we will not change the word of God. But today, there is a tremendous pressure coming from all sides for us to give in and to lie down and to surrender. But by the grace of God, never, 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 never shall we surrender. What about freedom of speech and freedom of religion? I believe today that freedom of speech and freedom of religion are being taken from us in America. In fact, the day is going to come if you stand up in a pulpit and if you preach or maybe even read texts out of the Bible, they're going to say, that's hate speech. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not politically correct. You're not allowed to say those things. Did I ever expect to see this happen like this? No. It caught me unaware. The betrayal of America takes place when we are forbidden to preach the word of God, when Christians are harassed and persecuted because of their religious beliefs. Now the hour is late, but the good news is good news. You know what the good news is? The good news is, is Jesus is coming. Amen. Ah. Amen. Folks, people say, oh, no, you, you're just going to be roll over in the mud. No, 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 no. Jesus is coming. Amen. We're on the winning side. Amen. We're going home to glory. There have been lots of silly men and women down through the ages who've attacked Jesus and the word of God and the law of God. Where are they? But the Bible is here. And Jesus is here. And the law of God is here. The good news is Jesus is coming. I would remind you, the darker the night, the brighter the stars will shine. God will always have his Daniels and Josephs and Elijahs and Pauls and Johns. The darker the night, the brighter the stars. And let me talk about the love of God. You know the text, you don't need to turn to it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest truth in the Bible is the truth that God loves us. The greatest miracle in the Bible is not the opening up of the Red Sea. The greatest miracle is that God loves sinners. He loves Jews. He loves Muslims. He loves Catholics and Protestants and Buddhists 
and communists. He loves that guy who's doing all those things up there in North Korea. He loves him. I'd like to go there one day and run a campaign. He loves, absolutely, absolutely. Might be my last one. He loves prostitutes. He loves politicians. He has a big love. He loves movie stars. He loves tax collectors, gays, lesbians, homosexuals, North Koreans, Iranians, Mexicans, Americans, Australians, Hispanics. He needs to because there are so many Hispanics. <laughs> Did you know the latest Time magazine has a tremendous article on the front cover? You know what it says? The Second Reformation. You folks don't read Time magazine, apparently. The Second Reformation. It says that millions and millions of Hispanics who came to this country not believing God but belonging to a great church are becoming believers in Jesus. The greatest movement is the movement of Hispanic people into the Christian Protestant church and away from the Church of Rome. That's one of the reasons we now have a pope who's Hispanic to try to stop, to just try to stop the flood. You can't stop it because God is behind it. It is a sign of the times and God loves them. How do we know God loves us? You know the woman who was caught in adultery? You know the story. I don't need to go into it in detail. But Jesus stooped down and wrote with his own finger the story of their filthy lives. Then he said to the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What a God that is. He loved her, a prostitute. He even loved the people who were sleeping with her. Then there was Mary Magdalene. How can we forget her? The Bible says she had seven demons. This is a symbolic expression to mean that she was full of the devil. And Jesus loved her home. He loved her so much that her heart felt as though it was going to burst. And she became his most ardent disciple. He loved her. He loves people. Then Peter, who absolutely messed up and denied the Lord with cursing and swearing. What a disgrace. The man who was supposed to be the rock became a pebble. And Jesus sent a message, go tell my disciples and uh, Peter. I love this poem. You've heard it. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. You know why we've got all these problems in the world today. You know why people have got these abnormalities with which they are born. We all have them. In one way or the other, we, none of us are straight. None of us are normal. We're all bent by sin. And some people are bent in just a different way. And the person who's bent the most is the pharisaical hypocrite who sits in the church every Sabbath, but whose heart is not touched by the love of God. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels song. Listen to these good words. When hoary time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call. It's going to happen. God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race. The saints and angels song. Could we with ink the ocean fill? 
Imagine it. Were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole. Though stretched from sky to sky. So God is a fervent lover. There's nothing you can do to stop him loving you. It doesn't mean he'll be able to save you. A person can only be saved when he sees himself as a wretched sinner and responds to the love of God and gets a lot of religion out of his soul. Now the hidden gospel. Come over here to 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 down to 6. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 down to 6. This is Paul. He said, Therefore, since through God's mercy, mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart, my friend, when you're getting kicked. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. We don't tell lies. Nor do we distort the word of God. Neither are we politically correct. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age is blind to the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of, dar- out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Is anybody here colorblind? You don't know. (laughs) Have you ever gone in and they've done a test on you and they put a, a jumble of colors in front of you and they say, what is it? I've had this. Mm. I could work out the first page. I said, that's letter one. Right. Okay, let's go to the second page. Now have a look. It's just pop out. If you're not colorblind, if everything is, is fine with your eyes or whatever, what number is that? Oh, I can see that. That's 27. Okay. Now let's go to the third page. What animal is that? I, I can't see an animal. Oh, it's easy. Well, let's go to the fourth page. Some, you know, this is when they're giving you tests. I discovered, I know the sky's blue and it looks blue. And I, I know your dress is, I think it's blue. Uh, and I know the shirt is green. No, no, I'm just kidding, folks. <laughs> but I am partially colorblind. So when a person who is not colorblind, he can pick out, he can see, that's an elephant there. I can't see anything like that. I say it's just a jumble of colors. The vast majority of people in the world, uh, when they read the Bible, uh, it's a jumble. They can't see it. Look at me. That is why this is incomprehensible. You can have people who are the leaders of the Christian church. They pontificate. They say all the right things, but there's something wrong with them. They can't see that there's anything wrong with them, but others can. They they don't understand the gospel. It is to them 
a mystery so profound that they think they've got it when they're walking in darkness. Scary, isn't it? Scary. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Galatians, made a remarkable statement that a great theologian pointed out to me many years ago when I was but a young man. He said, Paul said, he did not receive the gospel by the instruction of people, but he said, by a revelation from God. Listen to this. The greatest curse in the world is bad religion. And the hardest person to ever reach is a person who thinks he knows but doesn't know. And he's full up to hear with all of the right words. But the gospel is supernaturally revealed. And when the gospel is supernaturally revealed, all the colors take the face of Christ. That is why I urge people to break away from the brainwashing that we experience every day in America and take time to read the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you will never find Christ for salvation because your mind will be so filled with junk. So the gospel is hidden and is revealed by the Spirit of God. Remember, remember, John Newton said, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. I want you to come over here to Galatians 2 and verse 19 and onwards. This is a book that you should read. It is difficult, and that's another reason to read it. People say, but I find it incomprehensible. That is because you need the Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 2, 19 and onwards. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. What does it mean? Through the law I died to the law. The law can only say that you're guilty and you're going to die. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is more than a daily experience. It is talking about what happened when Christ died on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, I was in Christ. And when he died for sin, my sin was atoned for. Therefore, as far as the law of God is concerned, John Carter is dead. And the law cannot condemn a dead person. You've never seen that before? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law. Christ died for nothing. The law is not the gospel, and the gospel is not the law. The law kills me. I was on the cross. Christ gave himself for me. I am saved by grace. The righteousness that saves me is the righteousness that is the gift of God because of Christ, not because of my deeds. I want to read you a, a statement from a great scholar, Farah, in his classic, The Life of Christ. Listen. For indeed a death by crucifixion seems to include all that pain and death can have of horrible and ghastly. Dizziness, cramps, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, tetanus, publicity of shame, long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of untended wounds, all intensified just up to the point at which they can be endured at all but all stopping just short of the point which would give to the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins, the crushed tendons throbbed with incessant anguish. The wounds inflamed by exposure. 
Gradually gangrene, the arteries, especially of the head and the stomach, became swollen and oppressed with surcharged blood. And while each variety of misery went on gradually increasing, there was added to them the intolerable pang, pang of a burning and raging thirst. And all these physical complications caused an internal excitement and anxiety which made the prospect of death itself, of death, the last, the awful, unknown enemy at whose approach man usually shudders most, bear the aspect of a delicious and exquisite release. There is a doctrine that is going around today in our church, not in this church here, but certainly in Australia, where people are denying the doctrine of the Trinity. If you deny the doctrine of the Trinity, you deny the doctrine of the greatness of Christ. Because Christ hanging on the cross was more than a creature, more than an angel more than a being unspeakably exalted, hanging on the cross was Almighty God. El Shaddai, the Almighty One. Yahweh Elohim, the great I am. How much he loves us. God loved me enough to die for me. The gospel is not the law but it teaches that the law of God is eternal. Never forget it. The law demands justice. And Christ experienced justice. There was no grace for Christ on the cross. The warfare against the law is warfare against God. The gospel teaches that sin cannot be merely excused. It demands a blood atonement. The Lord demands a, a heaving sacrifice, a man crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If the law could be set aside, Christ would not have died. What Christ experienced on the cross, every lost sinner must experience. If he or she rejects Christ and his death, Therefore the Spirit of God comes and opens blind hearts that are willing and softens hard hearts to those who are willing. Are you willing? And this true gospel produces not a modification but a transformation. I have felt the love of God displayed in the lives of men and women. Never anywhere in the world have I seen the love of God so displayed as I saw it among our pastors from mainland China. I can understand why China is probably going to become the bastion of the Christian faith in the next 20 or 30 years. I met people there who'd suffered for Christ, who'd been beaten for Christ, who'd been flogged and kicked, and who'd slept for 15 or 20 years on concrete covered with blood. I was a worm in their presence. And when I met them, I said, this Christianity must be true. It certainly is not the Christianity of America or the Christianity of Australia. It is the Christianity of Christ. It is a suffering, fervent Christianity. And the love that flowed from those people, those Men and those women, that young woman who was the pastor of a church of 20,000 people and ordained. The love was so great that I said it must be true. In 92, I preached in our church in Nizhny Novgorod. I was there in the middle of winter and the people were very hungry. We didn't take up an offering. We passed out the offering baskets and we put money in the offering baskets so people could take money out of the baskets. But when I got up to preach and I started to talk from the word of God, the people all cried because I was the first foreigner. 
the babushkas, the old mothers, the young people. And when they came to me, they displayed so much love. I said to myself, it is true. This is not propaganda that we are talking about. This is not the religion of a decadent West. This is the religion of Christ. And I felt it. And I have also felt it in this church. Then there were the born fools, the Baptists, during the time of Stalin. When a communist was beating up another communist or an atheist, the person who was being tortured would scream out and blaspheme. And the Baptists, some of them would say, let me take the place of that prisoner. Beat me instead. The communists called them born fools. Said, you've got to be a born fool. And the Baptist said, torture us because we will not curse and blaspheme. We will praise God. Because if you torture an atheist, more hate goes out in the world. But if you torture a Christian, there'll be more love released. Do I understand that? No, I don't. It is the love of God. So this true gospel produces not a modification, but a transformation. Therefore, we need to seriously deal with our own sin-sick souls. Stop playing church and stop pretending to be what we're not and become the servants of Christ and stand up for his truth. God today wants soldiers who will stand up for Christ. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. And we should pray, open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. It is this gospel that saves the soul and for which the world is perishing. And if we open up our hearts and confess our sins and our laziness and our spiritual sloth and we cry out in mercy, we will no longer be colorblind, but we will see Christ on the cross and we will be saved by grace.